This is the Middle Earth Philosopher, where I take a look at people and ideas within Middle Earth and Tolkien's world and try to look at them through philosophical perspectives that may have existed in that world at that time. I'm talking about uh, today the death of Boromir that is presented as in the Lord of the Rings movie, The Fellowship of the Ring. And let me be clear that Boromir is one of my favorite characters. So it's not like I wanted him to die. Um, as part of the Fellowship of the Ring, he was already a notable warrior. He starts out the first movie as something of, though, as a, a, an antagonist to Aragorn, being the last descendant of the kings and everything, um, and Boromir himself being the son of the, of the ruling steward. There's already a power dynamic at play, even though it's one that Aragorn isn't, isn't looking for. That being said, uh, Boromir himself is still pretty much a prince of Gondor in everything but name only. Um, and therefore, Aragorn is a threat, whether he, li whether he likes it or not. And this leads up, um, this tension is building up between them throughout the movie. It kind of leads up towards the end where um, they finally have a confrontation where Boromir, who at this point has become more likable, I think, um, is basically um, trying to convince Aragorn legitimately to go to Gondor um, to seek rest and re refuge and help before going into Mordor, to which uh, Aragorn flatly refuses. He says that um, there's no help there that they can trust, and um, rightly, Boromir points out um, Aragorn's hypocrisy in that he went to the elves immediately when that option came up. And now, all of a sudden, he is refusing to um, go to Gondor. And, <clears throat> excuse me, this leads to a, uh, an opening dispute where the tension is kind of released between them. And Boromir flat out calls, calls out Aragorn, saying that he's basically prejudice, prejudiced against his own people. Um, that, yes, you know, humans are weak and they're vulnerable and they can be corrupted. But at the same time, they also have more positive qualities that exist as well. And Aragorn, being raised by elves and everything, refuses to see that. In Aragorn's eyes, there is nothing good within humanity, and he includes himself in that as well, you know, for to be fair to him and everything. Um, that being said, though, um, this ultimately leads up to a division between the two that is not rectified until the end of the movie. And which is my favorite scene in all three trilogies, excuse me, all three movies, and I'm about to explain why. So one of the biggest reasons why this is my favorite um, moment in the movie is how it presents Aragorn and Boromir's relationship as the competing ideas of masculinity, um, the traditional view and the progressive view. The traditional view basically establishes that male bonds are oriented and built off uh, conflict, basically. That their closeness and within extreme situations of war and sacrifice um, is what allows for circumstances for men to become close to each other. Um, it's the only time, for the most part, within this view that men can show anything other than aggression or anger because it's that's already been established within, within the circumstances. Um, that being said though, um, this shared common and extreme experience is, is very common um, within a lot of veterans and everything where, or, and firefighters and other people who are frontline service people, people who undergo um, experiences that are traumatizing and very extreme, but um, they, that it's, not, it's not shared with anyone else, people who are outside of that. They just, we, I should say, just don't get it. And um, in the movie, Aragorn and, uh, and Boromir have this relationship. So um, it has that on the one hand. On the other hand, though, it also has the more um, progressive view of masculinity. That being that it does show intimate moments between the two, particularly at the end, when Aragorn kisses uh, Boromir's forehead um, after he dies. 
and just that entire moment where Boromir has broken down at this point, um, admitting that he's failed both as a um, the next in line to be the ruling steward, um, as a man for the most part, and more importantly, as a warrior. Um, it's something that he would never he never thought he would see himself as or doing, and yet here he is. And um, you have Aragorn here who is trying to comfort him, and he's kind of running his fingers through his hair, trying to um, put him at ease, you know, in these final moments of his life, you know, and clearly seeing that, um, you know, wow, this person who he had no respect for initially just went all out, you know, killed a shit ton of orcs, and yet even despite that, you know, he feels that he's nothing because he failed to protect um, the hobbits from being captured by the orcs. And he really feels this, he really feels for him, and feels that um, he has now seen what Warmer was telling him about, about the goodness of men and their more courageous aspects that he himself was denying. So, uh, it creates this circumstance with an Aragorn that follows him throughout the next two movies, where he becomes more open and accepting and learning that at least of his own human side. And to the point where in Two Towers he gets, to, gets into a fight with Legolas, um, um, the elf, when he urges them that they should just leave uh, Rohan. And Aragorn angrily refu absolutely refuses to and um, says that he'll die it as a human being, you know, if, if that's what it needs, what it needs to be. Where Legolas was kind of treating him as something other than human. Um, so it it sets up those two viewpoints of masculinity and one of the geniuses of this is how both subvert the other without trumping the other because they are both coexisting in the same relationship at the same time but it's organic it's not forced it's not um, constructed excuse me um, as you can say so also, too, um, there's nothing particularly sexual or romantic between Aragorn and Boromir at all. Um, and yet, they are expressing this love toward each and respect towards each other that most people associate with that kind of relationship. Um, and they both establish that they are men, you know, so to speak, you know, already. And that's there's no one that's going to question that by this point. Yet, um, despite that. They still uh, feel no concern about their manliness, you know, at this point where um, it doesn't really matter one way or the other because he's got, their former is going to die, you know. Um, so, and there's a lot of historical precedents, uh, precedents for this as well, such as the Sacred Band of Thebes, who were uh, warriors who fought during the Peloponnesian War and were just as well were known as the Spartans. But they were also well known for having sexual relationships between men um, within their own ranks. So there you are. Um, another aspect as to why Boromir is my favorite character um, and why his death was my favorite scene in the movie, um, again, was his legacy um, that he leaves behind for his friends that he basically died for. Um, in the second movie, when Frodo, who was assaulted by Boromir when he was trying to take the ring from him, um, is told by um, Faramir, who was Boromir's uh, younger brother, that Boromir's died, rather than, you know, disrespecting, you know, Boromir, like, good, I'm glad he's dead, he tried to kill me, or something along those lines, he's extremely upset, and he's demanding to know what happened, um, because he doesn't see or hold Boromir responsible for what he did. Um, it was the corruption of the One Ring. And Frodo knows that, he's aware of that, and therefore um, it's not a major relief to him that um, his former friend and his former momentary enemy is dead. It's it's a grief, it's a, it's a loss, you know? And you see um, the other hobbits express this as well. Um, when Pippin is in Gondor, and Pippin knows that he is not a warrior. 
He knows he sucks at it, and he he's, he has sucked at it throughout the last two movies. But um, he decides to join the army of Gondor and fight um, during the siege of Gondor um, because of how much he admired Boromir and how he much he considered him a friend. You know, and that inspiration um, helps push Per. Um, uh, excuse me, Pippin, to go beyond his comfort zone in a major way, and that's it's a, it's a very big deal for him, um, given his own personal journey and whatnot. Um, lastly, though, I liked how um, Boromir struggles with the, with the duality of being vulnerable. Um, because throughout the first movie, he feels that conflict that he has a role to play. You know, he is um, the next in line to be in the ruling steward. He is a high prince of Gondor, you know, as I said before, and, and everything but name. And he's proud of that, you know. He's proud of the heritage and legacy of his culture, um, of his people, and his city and empire that Gondor used to be. And he wants to bring that back. He wants to... And you know, for all intents and purposes, make Gondor great again, and it's possible that he might might have because the movie does a good job establishing that um, he was a mighty warrior. You know, um, he wasn't a coward. Um, that being said, though, he also struggled with allowing other people to know the weaknesses of his people, weaknesses that he was very much well aware of, but at the same time. He either hid it from them, was in denial about it a little bit, or just felt that it wasn't anyone else's business. And it's the encounter with Galadriel that forces him to confront that weakness and vulnerability because Galadriel, just by looking at him, is telling him that she already knows. She knows the whole story. And there's nothing that Vormir can do to hide that from her. And he is extremely intimidated and afraid, you know, by this by her and by her great power um, and able to deduce this from him just by looking at him and reading his heart and reading his mind um, and from that point on um, he really has a hard time uh, facing up to these things but it's also what allows him to be willing to accept Aragorn um, for the time being at the least as he's a noble of Gondor so, um, basically, um, Boromir is not saying that this guy is the next line to be king and that he effectively outranks him, but he is saying that you are a prince of Gondor, you are a noble of Gondor, and you should be treated with, you know, as such respect and everything. And he wants him to be treated that way, which is more importantly, more establishing that um, bond, uh, brotherly bond between the two men. So... Um, but, as everyone knows, the ring takes advantage of his care for his people because the ring is um, most powerful around people who are looking for power, even if for a good reason. And Boromir absolutely is looking for power to protect his people, as he is always saying, but he's not able to handle it. And that's the irony of it, is because when everyone talks about him, you know, later on, everyone, t everyone is saying how great a man he is. He is, he is the Superman of Middle Earth for all intents and purposes. You know, he can handle anything. And now, um, everyone, including Boromir himself, is facing up to this realization that he can't handle everything. He can't handle the One Ring. He can't handle the will of Sauron, just like everyone else in Middle Earth, apparently. So. This dichotomy um, of strength and vulnerability, and then Boromir's resolve in confronting that vulnerability to rise to the occasion and protect the hobbits to all his might, which might, which leads to him killing scores of orcs and orcs and stuff, um, speaks well for him. So when when Aragorn is um, consoling him as he's dying, saying that he's kept his honor and everything, he's not bullshitting him. Um, he really did. You know, he did everything that he could possibly do, given the circumstances. And he did not shrink from that, you know, in the end. And even more so, he was 
man enough, man enough, if you will, to admit that, you know, he fucked up, you know, he made a mistake trying to take the ring and everything. And through these, he's able to finally admit to Aragorn that he is the king, that more so that he deserves to be king because at this point, Boromir, you know, tells him that if he had was going to live longer, he would have followed him, you know. And it's a heartbreaking moment, but it's also a very powerful moment. And that's the reason why Boromir is my favorite character and why his death is my favorite scene. Um, not just in that trilogy, but in probably most movies that I usually watch. <laughs>